Live from the MGM Grand Convention Center in Las Vegas, Nevada, it's The Q at Splunk.com 2014. Brought to you by headline sponsor, Splunk. Here are your hosts, John Furrier and Jeff Kelly. Okay, welcome back everyone. We're live in Las Vegas. This is theCUBE, our flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the signals and noise. I'm John Furrier, the co-founder of SiliconANGLE Media with the number one big data analyst from Wikibon, Jeff Kelly, and uh, we're psyched to be here covering the Splunk Conference live in Las Vegas. And our next guest is Mark Debney, principal engineer, DevOps, B Sky B. Welcome to theCUBE. Right, thank Great you. To have, so we, before we came on with the intros, we're talking about DevOps, which we love, and security, which we're really been riffing on all day mm -hmm. today. So I got to get your, ta your take on the following. The keynotes here are all about using data with security. Obviously security is the top issue on everyone's plate these days. And then you get the cloud, which is perimeterless. There's <laughs> no perimeter in the cloud. How do you make it all work? What's your take on all this? I mean, you know, are we in early innings? We're scratching our heads. Is there some solutions coming to the table? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, um, it's a really interesting field and we're kind of, uh, we've really just started kind of looking at kind of, we've developed a lot of our own tools and now we're kind of um, struggling with kind of capacity and kind of scaling those tools out because the you know, security is becoming a harder and harder battle to fight. So we're looking at um, tools like Splunk to kind of allow us to scale up to- And you um, guys are building out a capacity, more capacity, more capacity, right? Yeah, so we've just gone into a couple of new data centers for our platform and um, along with that, we've kind of implemented a new um, Splunk infrastructure to go along with that, yeah. Awesome, talk about the security angle, because you, you and I were talking earlier about the patterns, big data surfaces up, and you can see things. Tell us about what, how you look at the security attacks. I mean, is it one by one? Are you, is it a global kind of threat? Is there individuals? How, what's yeah. the landscape look like? So we look at um, attacks on a kind of a, a long-term basis. So there are lots of products out there that can, you know, they're, they can block the DDoS attacks, that sort of stuff. But we're looking at the attacks that are slow burn. They, they go on for um, hours or even days. And it's about trying to track those and the, just the, the normal, they kind of hide really well under the normal traffic. So you start to kind of recognize uh, these kind of individual attacks. You, know, you get like a, a bit of a personal relationship with these guys, you know, <laughs> they're trying to get in. You can recognize their particular attacks and you can kind of- um, It's like dance moves, people. right? Like, let's see their moves, you can get this, so you're saying you can see their moves, and you're saying, okay, I've seen that, I know that guy. Yeah. He's going to do the head fake again. And they, and they definitely, um, you know, you, you counteract and then they, t they do another counter, counter attack. So, you know, you got to keep on how they're- you Sounds know, fun. I mean, it sounds like a. It sounds like my kids playing Call of Duty or Destiny. It sounds really good. It, it, it is a bit of a game, but it's a game that you it's can never game. stop playing. You've got to <laughs> yeah, keep on yeah. going. So, uh, so Mark, so how do you actually how do you how do you adapt? How do you handle the you know never-ending onslaught of security threats coming at B Sky B? I mean, we we've talked to a, a few guests today uh, on the Cube about you know the, the, the threats are nonstop. They are always changing. As you mentioned, yeah. you, you kind of get a, a, maybe a personal relationship, but they're always adapting as well. So, so how do you approach yeah. it? So we've got um, a really neat group of guys, which are like a dedicated team, and they sit within our identity platform. They work closely with the development teams that are building the identity platform. Um, my DevOps team and the network engineers, they also participate in that um, security team. And th that's basically what they do. They look for attacks and they, um, they counter attack them. So it's, it's about having like a dedicated team. You're prepared to put the resources in and the time mm -hmm. to actually fight them. So it's, uh, Godfrey Sullivan, the CEO of Splunk, mentioned in his keynote that security uh, Fighting uh, the bad guys, uh, network security is very much an analytic challenge versus a reporting problem. Yeah. Um, do you agree with that approach? I mean, how do you uh, look at the challenge from a analytics perspective? Um, it's you know it's it's such a like a massive scale as well. So it's it's you know it's really difficult to say if you're winning the battle or not because as soon as you find one attack vector, you know. You, you clear that off the board, and then you find another couple more. So it's kind of a, you know, you can't say that you're necessarily winning, you can only say that you're kind of holding your ground, mm -hmm. so. 
Well, so let's dig in a little bit in terms of specifically what is Splunk helping you do? I mean, how, how are you approaching this? So we've got um, a number of real-time rules that um, analyze the traffic that's coming in, that looks over quite a long period of time, and we can find those small little tweaks. So um, it's kind of looking for the impossible. So you know, it's very unlikely that a user would sign in in one location and then half an hour sign in from a, a completely different country, say. So you kind of, that's a very simple example, but then you can kind of build on that and make really complicated rules to try and track down and narrow down whether or not this is, um, you know, maybe it is someone's just got in a plane and you know, the last thing they did was check their email and then they check their email again as soon as they touched down. So you've got to kind of look um, across, you know, large amounts of data to kind of determine whether or not something's an attack or whether it's, you know, just normal behavior that might look a bit odd to you. Mm -hmm. So when you're, so that was a really, you said simple, but a good example, I think it helps mm. kind of illustrate the challenge. Um, and so when you're looking at finding those kinds of patterns, is it a, is it mainly a manual effort um, where you have to basically use some common sense and say, look, it's pretty unlikely that this person 30 minutes later is going to be in another country, or does Splunk and some of the other tools you use help automate that process? We definitely try and automate it as much as possible, and I think once you've got a good rule set, um, you definitely need to go back and review them on a pretty regular basis, but you can automate large chunks of that, especially the easy, kind of easy to spot ones, but there's also a, a need to um, have that kind of human interaction where if you kind of present it up and say, you know, Splunk can say, this is an attack or potential attack, and someone can eyeball it, confirm it is or, or not, or do it, maybe modify the rule, you know, and then go from there. Mm -hmm. So, uh, obviously, you must be taking in a lot of data. So, talk a little bit about the data sources. You've got, you're, you're checking the, the logs from your applications. Where's all this data coming from? So, um, the identity platform is basically the gateway to all of Sky's services. So that's, you know, there's some um, really good services in there, like streaming um, media, so Sky Go, Now TV, that kind of stuff. So like really high profile traffic that um, people are really trying to get into. But there's also things like email and account management, mm -hmm. um, which are also really key and real prime targets for attackers. So, um, but we've got, devices coming in from the web, but we've also iPads and iPhones and Roku devices and Samsung TVs have now got apps. and So it's coming from everywhere. Mm -hmm. and, and how does that uh, diversity of data sources make your, make your job harder? Um, it makes it a lot harder, because you've got to take into account where people are coming from to determine whether or not it's an, an attack. So if you're type, logging in on your phone, you're more likely to get your password wrong because it's so much more difficult to type it in. But uh, it's, so it's just another weighting on the, onto the problems that you have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And compare this to what you were doing before or what the organization was doing before, mm -hmm. uh, or, or maybe walk us through how this evolved. Um, I imagine trying to do some of these things in a more manual approach just isn't, isn't sustainable, and it's probably part of the reason you look to a company like Splunk, but take us back a little bit and kind of give us the before sure. and after a little. So we've been looking at, um, we've been doing this for actually quite a long time, and, and well before we had Splunk as well. Mm -hmm. And so that was using a lot of in-house development. Um, so we created our own tools to do this. And we had like basically the, the security team was spending a lot of their time writing um, the application and making it scale to kind of cope with um, and keep up with the growth of the actual identity platform. And it became kind of, yes, we were coping and surviving, but you know, we were spending a lot more time scaling out than we were actually fighting in fighting the security mm -hmm. attacks. So. And what role does outside data sources uh, play in terms of helping you be a little more proactive? So you've, you've got you know, security threats around the world or hitting more than just B-Sky B. Do you look to either your peers in other industries or um, do you look to outside sources to help you get a sense of what's going on at any given day, any given point in time? Yeah, we do. So we've, we've, we look at um, a number of kind of different appliances and things that are kind of giving us feeds on what the latest sort of attacks look like. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of the people that are doing what we're doing, they keep their security rules as guarded as we do. Yeah, well, <laughs> I, I, I thought that would probably be the case, and you know, I, I think there would be, there is an opportunity for industry, um, if we can find a way to facilitate more data sharing to mm. improve the collective security capabilities overall. Yeah, But absolutely. obviously, if you're, if part of your value proposition, or, or if, if your security capabilities are actually a a value add for your for your company and is creating value for you a differentiation. Then you don't want to necessarily share that with competitors or even others that are maybe not be directly competitive. You want to hold on to that. So yeah. that is a challenge. 
So talk about your DevOps journey, because one of the things I wanted to talk about it now is this notion of infrastructure as code, which is kind of a sexy term. We love it because it means it's adaptive, it's programmable, it's got virtualization. Um, certainly the cloud has a perimeterless market. Everyone yeah. wants to move to the cloud, but it's not that easy. So you got trade-offs going on right now. Mm -hmm. The banks lock down their data. They're kind of taking slower, but people move it faster. What's your take on that cloud migration? Because developers are a key part of this new modern infrastructure. The apps are, are being required for user experience to be awesome, mm -hmm. fast iteration, but yet cloud economics work well, but yet the security issue. So balance yeah. that. Yeah, it is. It's a real balancing act. I mean, if I could get a couple of devs to cross over and become DevOps, then that would, that would make my day. Um, we've, we've been doing DevOps for quite a while at Sky, um, probably before it was even called DevOps. So we, I started out as a, a system administrator, basically, in a, a development team. And kind of the, the need came from the development teams wanting to work in a more agile way and wanting their operations side to kind of join them in that path. So we were um, building our VMs and things in the same sort of model and style that the developers wanted to work at. Um, now we've kind of Sky's really taken that a lot more seriously and we've kind of got lots of DevOps across Sky working on lots of different projects um, and it's about kind of consolidating the skill sets and um, really working with the central operations teams and um, working with the development teams. So, so it's more focused on forward progress, less about maintenance of what you're building. I mean, that's the trade-off, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and there's, there's some things that we um, allow the central operations team to kind of maintain and look after because, you know, I don't particularly mind that yeah. an ESX host goes down as yeah. long as the application stays up and the HA take care of it. You know, I, I, I'm more focused on spinning up VMs as fast as I possibly can. You know, and, it's, and, the, and it puts the emphasis on development. It does, yeah. So describe the folks out there, you mentioned DevOps. What does a DevOps person look like to you? When they walk in the door, how do you spot an ace, a diamond, a, a diamond in the rough, or, you know, uh, you know, a pro athlete, if you will, for you, you know, um, the, the throwing touchdowns. What's the equivalent, throwing a touchdown, scoring the goal? <laughs> I mean, what's the equivalent version of a DevOps star? Um, it's really odd, but I actually look for someone that's really lazy. I want someone that will not want to <laughs> do the same job twice. I want someone that will, Always be smart and lazy. Smart and lazy. <laughs> always looking to Tell automate. Son. <laughs> yeah, automate everything that they can. Yeah. So there's uh, definitely the the pushes for more and more abilities to actually write. Well, lazy code. and this, I'm I'm joking about my son. He's super smart. He's got a great initiative. But lazy, you mean like they're not going to tolerate redundancy and, and like boredom. Like okay, yeah. this is a useless task. Let's automate that. So it's really around okay, someone thinking like automate that, that's an easy thing we can replace. Taking yeah. out friction. Yeah, absolutely, and kind of um, joining steps together that would, would have been manual, or like you've got automation here, automation there, let's automate that bit in the middle and make it one seamless. So is DevOps way. people a unique breed? Um, I mean, we always say DevOps guys are like, they eat glass and spit nails, you know, like they're tough and they're different today. But you start to see it become much more popular, cloud ops, some say. Um, do you see DevOps becoming, I mean, obviously it's an engineering discipline, mm. so it's not like they're just, you know, throwing code around like a, like a website, but you know, there's yeah. some engineering involved, right? Yeah. So what else do you see as DevOps becoming more stream? What does it look like? Uh, what's some of the general sentiment around DevOps? Do you think there's, they're pigeonholing guys to be super, heroes type role, or do you see it becoming much more mainstream? I think it's going to become a, a lot more mainstream. And it's really difficult though, because you've got, um, you tend to be, have to be very broad in your skill set. So you've got to be great at automating, writing code, but you've also got to be able to um, you know, pick up a new technology. You've always got to be looking forward at what's coming out there um, and be able to implement that and pick it up as fast as you can. You know? you know, the, the devs are always going to drive you because um, they're, they're also looking forward as well. They're looking at the latest version of Java, latest kind of key bits, and they, they need you to kind of keep up. Okay, so I want to ask you a personal question, well, a personal industry question, not personal, personal <laughs> question. What is the craziest thing that you've seen, either here or in your job, where you went, wow, that, I never would have thought that use case. Could be security, could be a hack, it could be an attack, it could be something awesome and elegant. I mean, what was like, what's the craziest thing you've seen? Um, Crazy well, good, I mean. I'm like, not, like, it could be like, you know, we had to hear Chew saw from the, from the IBM saying, yeah, we busted this drug operation because of big data, and that was interesting and crazy. But what, what's crazy? What, what's we crazy? Had a, um, we've got some really unusual traffic profiles, so 
um, you know, when we start a football game or soccer over here, as you call it, um, we get massive spikes. So no one ever actually seems to want to sign in early and watch the pre-game commentary. They like to sign in right on kickoff. So we get these massive spikes. So that's one of the things that we look at when we're looking at security, kind of taking into account these spikes. But we had a, um, an issue a while back where we got this massive spike and we couldn't figure out what on earth was going on. And it was um, in signups and it was coming out from all around the world. Lots of people were signing up, had no idea what was going on. And it turns out that it was uh, Harry Styles from One Direction uh, tweeted something saying that he was going to be on a, on a, a Sky show. And all of a sudden, all of this traffic from all around the world just started signing up and getting in there. And we, it took us a while to kind of track down so it what really this didn't event have was. A, it was the pattern that wasn't a pattern. Yeah, we were scratching was, our head. We were thinking, this is an attack. This is a really odd attack. We've got no idea what, the, what they're trying to do here. But they're, you know. yeah, it's kind of like a new movie. Hey, we've we got a new guy. In, that, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> a new guy in the, uh, the attack cycle. But it turns out it was actually legit. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. Was, so well, thankfully, we didn't start blocking traffic. <laughs> Well, Mark, I want to thank you for coming on theCUBE. Really appreciate your insight and candor and, and commentary. Um, I'll give you the last word. Share it with the folks out there. You know, what's going on at the event here? People who aren't here watching on the interview. What's, what's the vibe? What's the show like? What's the themes? What, what are some things in the hallway you're hearing? Just quick summarize uh, what's yeah, going on. Yeah, I mean, on. it's just been absolutely epic. I mean, the scale of it is just incredible. I mean, I've, I mean, it was at the keynote this morning and it was just, the vibe was amazing. And, some of the new features that are coming out are just, you know, I just can't wait to get my hands on it, basically. <laughs> it's like a playground for you, right? Yeah, it's it like, is, absolutely. So Splunk, is you like, you're happy with Splunk, obviously? Oh, very happy, yeah. yeah. What is the one thing that you can say it's changed your world? In terms of being in the spirit of good lazy, um, what has it done for you in, in laziness and also uh, well, productive? For us, it's about giving um, visibility to teams outside of identity. We're, in identity, we're very kind of closed about, very protective of our data, and that includes our logs. But we're now able to kind of surface dashboards and give visibility back to the business on what's exactly happening, what our capacity is, you know, and how we're currently going. So that's really All right, great. Mark, thanks for coming on theCUBE. Really appreciate it. We are live in Las Vegas here for Splunk2014.com. Splunk Conference is the hashtag. This is theCUBE. We'll be right back after this short break. <laughs>